Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. Of course, Proverbs is known as the wisdom book. Most, if not all of it, is attributed to Solomon, supposedly the wisest man who ever lived. But there's one thing we know for sure. Who was the strongest man? Samson. Strong, wisest was Solomon. Probably the most religious was David. He wrote all those psalms of worship and praise we still sing today. But I want you to notice that Samson failed and he had all that strength. Solomon failed and he had all that wisdom. David failed and he had all that religion. All these things are great, but we're going to fall. The righteous falls seven times. So don't think you're always going to get it right. If you're going to go to heaven, you're going to have to learn how to get back up. When I fall, I shall arise. Amen? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 26. Amen. Watch this. There it goes. I knew. See, I was going to. I was going to say, let there be light or let there be scripture, but I was going to. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. That means when it don't make sense to you, just trust God anyway. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Now, acknowledge is a combination word. You can put it like this. Act on your knowledge. Act as if God is with you, number one. Act as if God is in charge, number two. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance with all the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth. So if God gets on to you, that's because he loves you. Even as a father of the son in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. In the merch, for the, the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than of fine gold. She, speaking of wisdom now, she is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. Again, speaking of wisdom, her ways are the ways of of pleasantness and all her paths are peace wisdom always seeks for peace she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her the lord by wisdom hath founded the earth by understanding he hath established the heavens by his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew my son, let not them depart from thy eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shall thou walk. Then shall thou walk in thy, the, thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble. King James English here. It's hard to read. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Be not afraid of sudden fear. I'll say that again. Be not afraid of sudden fear. If the devil's going to control any person, any community, any nation, it's going to be through the means of fear. But what if we die? Will we get to go to heaven? What a horrible situation we're in. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. For the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Verse 26, thank you, we threw that. Oh, go, keep going for me. Well, no, that's it. You're right, that's the end. Go to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll begin in verse 24 through verse 31. 
But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see, you're calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. That means people who think they know a lot. Not many mighty men, people think they don't need a lot. Not many noble men, people think they're religious enough, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God doesn't want anybody that thinks they got it made without him. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Finally, verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God revealed. Now, the wisdom of God revealed was to submit to death that you might have victory. Doesn't make sense on a carnal level. In most stories, the, the hero always defeats the bad guy. But in this story, the hero submits to the bad guy, and through submission, he has eternal victory. And that is the wisdom of God. And we by wisdom humble ourselves and God exalts us. Does it make sense to humble yourselves? But if you don't humble yourselves, God can't exalt you. Brother Tenney said it like this. God wants to exalt you. But you got to humble yourself. And if you insist on doing God's job, he'll do yours. In other words, if you insist on exalting yourself because of your strength, because of your wisdom, because of your abilities, if you exalt yourself, God will bring you down. But if you want God to bring you up, humble yourself. That takes wisdom. The world's wisdom says exalt yourself. God's wisdom says, no, humble yourself. God's wisdom says when they do you wrong, love them, pray for them, and do them right. Amen. Ah, see, that's the wisdom of men you're operating in. The wisdom of God says when they slap one cheek, turn them the other cheek. That's not the wisdom of men. That's the wisdom of God. And so God's ways are stronger than our ways. Wisdom in, its, in a nutshell, wisdom is good judgment, our right judgment, to know how to deal with a situation. Knowledge is to know there is a situation. Wisdom is to know how should I react, respond, or not respond to a situation. You know, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on you don't have to get involved in. It's going to make your life a whole lot better if you just say, you know what? That's not my zoo and them ain't my monkeys. I'll let them have their zoo. Yeah, but I could sure add a two cents there. Yeah, keep your two cents. You'll be richer. You'll be two cents richer if you just keep it to yourself. Hello? Sometimes wisdom is just to close your mouth. That's why God gave you two ears and one mouth. He wants you to listen twice as much as you talk. Brother Tenney said you never have to apologize for what you don't say. Wisdom is the principal thing. It's good judgment. And we all have to make judgment calls day by day on many things. And so we should pray. I pray for wisdom often because the Bible says if many la any man lacks wisdom, and that's every man, you just got to be first. You got to be wise enough to know you're dumb. 
And that comes with humbling yourself. You know, when you go before God, it's always good to say, now you're deity and I'm dirt. There's a big difference between you and me, God. That's wisdom. And because I'm dirt and you're deity, and you said you'd give me wisdom if I asked for it, I'm here to ask for wisdom. I asked the Lord this morning in prayer. I said, Lord, give me wisdom to be a good husband. Give me wisdom to be a good father. Give me wisdom to be a good boss. Give me wisdom to be a good Christian. Give me wisdom to be a good pastor. Help me, God. I don't know what I'm doing. That's wisdom. Wisdom of this world is like, oh, I'll figure this out by myself. You're going to be in for a world of trouble. But wisdom is good judgment. The ability to discern what is best. Everybody say best. You know, when I went to college years ago, they, especially in medical school, oh my goodness. Every answer on the test was right. Can I get an amen, Sister Takema? They're all right. Just one is best. Or one should come before the next step. They might all need it, but this one was the first one you need. You want to do the, the, the in the right order. And so sometimes it's not like a situation you don't need three, four, five things. You got to say, God, give me wisdom of what I need to do now. What's best? And that takes wisdom because life will show you, throw some curveballs at you where a lot of things need to be done. But you got to know what comes first. And I can tell you this for sure. We know from the word of God, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things he'll take care of. So you ain't got to guess at that when God just kind of gave you the answer. He said, put me first and I'll take care of the rest. Amen. All the pomp and circumstance that day, they signaled something out of the ordinary. As the horns, the flutes, the harps, the lyres were sounding off and people from every station of life and every nation in the world fell down before that golden image of King Nebuchadnezzar that he had put up before them. And he said, when all the music plays, everyone must bow to the golden image. And Michel glanced over at Hanel and who looked over to Azariah. This is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's their Hebrew names. Their Jewish names were Mishael and Haniah and Azariah. And those names all had to do with the one God, Jehovah. If the devil wants to take anything away from us, it's who our God is. If I ever ask you why you're Pentecostal, say, because I believe Jesus is God and beside him there is nobody else. They say, yeah, but we believe in one God. Yeah, but you take that one God and you make him three separate persons. I don't. That doesn't make me better than you, but I believe the word clearly says when I've seen Jesus, I've seen the Father. And I believe him. And that was their Jewish names that looked back to the one God of the Hebrews. And suddenly here they are standing before this golden statue and suddenly they seem taller than everybody else. Because they roll after roll after roll of magistrates and, and commoners and religious folks and even fellow Jews and religious people from all walks of life fell flat before that statue of that idol. You know why? Because if you didn't, you get to burn. My goodness. It's going to be kind of hard to decide if they really want to convert or not if you threaten them with a fiery furnace. And so that was what they, and they stood there that day. And that feeling of many eyes looking upon them soon hit them. And it transported Hanaya back to another moment in life. And this time was a room filled with fellow captives and a menu of rations that the Jews were forbidden to eat. And earthly wisdom whispered to him at that time, nobody's looking, everybody else is doing it. Just eat the food like everybody else. Do what these new overlords say you are to do and don't rock the boat. Why endanger yourself now with these Jewish teachings you were raised with? And Why, why, not, why not just go along? 
But anyway, you're a captive now, right? The Jewish kingdom's been destroyed, right? Why don't you just go along and not worry about what Jehovah said? That was earthly wisdom. But they had a boy there with them named Daniel. Daniel had been there to insist on a different course and to maintain the wisdom that comes from God. And Daniel was there to say, no, God's ways are still best. Even though we're in a situation we don't want, but we deserve, God's ways are still right and they're still best. And he was right. Following the ways of God resulted in those boys, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, to receiving favor and being exalted in the kingdom of Babylon into great high places in government. Here's what happened. Wisdom said, humble yourself and do what God wants you to do. And when they humbled themselves and did what God wanted, God said, now I can pick you up. I've prayed for years and I still do that the Lord would put me in the place he wants me to be. Here's why. If you, if you exalt yourself, somebody can knock you down. If a human puts you up, some other human can knock you down. But if the Lord puts you up, nobody can take you down until God takes you down. But the only one God will put up is those who humble themselves and do what he wants. And so as the symphony played one more time, we find Hanel and Michelle and Azariah walking to that fiery furnace. These faithful Hebrews did not let their current circumstance deter them from following the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God looked foolishness to the world. But it wasn't. Because in about a few days, the king looked in and said, I still see those boys walking around. And then it looks like one like the Son of God is in there with them. God, give us wisdom to follow your ways when it don't make no sense. And we're getting real close, church. You better hear me well. We're getting real close to when the world's going to institute the mark of the beast. It's going to be the most wonderful system you've ever seen. It's going to have so many good aspects to it. And you ain't got to worry about child abduction. And we're going to make sure your money's right where you need it all the time. And all you got to do is just go with the flow. And, and by, anyway, some of your church members are doing it too. So just go ahead and get on board and everybody get together. It's not the wisdom of God. You better stay with the wisdom of God. Well, how are you going to make it? Same way I'm making it right now. He's taking care of me now. Amen. He'll take care of me then. Amen. We have all encountered know-it-alls in our life. Anybody ever met a know-it-all? All right, we're going to get tight right here. Here's your opportunity to humble yourself, though. You ready? God can exalt you if you hum Anybody ever been a know-it-all? Well, hallelujah. Anybody ever been a teenager? You was a know-it-all, all right? You just didn't know it all, but you knew it all, all right? Lord have mercy. I thought, man, if my parents just knew it all. Now I'm looking back and saying, Lord, they did know it all. We've all encountered know-it-alls in our life. And I'm sure everyone has been thought of as a know-it-all. When we discuss a topic about which we are quite knowledgeable, we can appear as a know-it-all. But knowledge does not always equal wisdom. Knowledge is knowing a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Can I get an amen? Amen. When they bring you that fruit salad and they put tomatoes in it, you just say, listen, you're not very wise. Hey Amen. Is a tomato a fruit or is it a vegetable? I don't know. Huh? It's a fruit? I don't know. Yeah, which came first? The chicken? or the, well, I do know that one, but the chicken came first. But I don't know what category to put a tomato in. I can tell you this. Just don't put it on my burger. You can put it in my ketchup. I like it. But don't put no raw tomato on my burger to ruin it. Somebody say praise the Lord. We'll have an altar call for the rest of y'all later on. <sighs> but we can know stuff. I don't know we know that doesn't mean we know how to deal with it correctly. And God gives us a thing called wisdom. 
and wisdom from God often does not look wise to this world. That's why the Bible says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And the wisdom of God is stronger than anything the world has. Really, we don't know it all. We need humility to obtain wisdom. We have to get down for God to give us what we need. Remember a pediatrician years ago, Dr. Hathorne told me, and he had been a pediatrician for many years. He was talking about medical stuff, and I was in medical school, and he's like, you know, I, I know a lot. He said, but what I've really learned in all this learning is that I know way less than I thought I did. I know just enough to try this pill, and if that don't work, we'll try that pill, and if that don't work, we'll try this pill. In other words, I really don't know. <laughs> just try it. In 1 Kings 3, when the Lord promised to give Solomon whatever he asked, the young man, as a young man, was a young king. He didn't ask for honor or riches or long life, and he could have. He recognized the daunting task ahead of him, so he asked God for wisdom. Wisdom, the Bible says, is the principal thing. And all you're getting, get wisdom. And put wisdom above everything else. And if you get wise, you're going to want God. Because you're going to realize how foolish you really are. It takes a wise man to realize, I really, really, really need God. Most people don't need God because they're wise, the Bible says, in their own eyes. The Bible says don't be like that. Be not wise in your own eyes. Depart from evil. Seek the Lord. Walk in his ways and he will exalt you. And so Solomon, as a young man, set aside his pedigree and his power and he embraced humility to be the leader God knew he could be if he just had wisdom. Sadly, we know, though, that Solomon did not always follow the ways of wisdom. For the Bible says he married many wives from other countries, and they turned his heart against God, and God told him that would happen. Solomon broke every rule that kings had in Deuteronomy. One rule was you cannot multiply gold and silver to yourself. You can have gold and silver, but don't multiply it to yourself and store it up until you got a Why? Because if you get enough money, you'll think you don't need Jesus said that. He said it's hard for a rich man to go to heaven. Why? Because they don't realize they need God. Missionaries can go to other countries where they don't have running water and don't have electricity. And they can get a crowd to walk to church. Yeah. Amen. You go to a country where everybody's got running water and electricity and they're blessed, 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 blessed. Come on, Come on. Come on. They don't see their need yeah. of God. Somebody say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. And Solomon multiplied gold. Another rule he had was you couldn't multiply horses. You know why? Because when battle, that horse was the main, I mean, in that day there wasn't no air force. There were horses and men. So whoever got a horse had the upper hand. If I got a fight between me and somebody else and he ain't got a horse and I do, I'm already ahead of the game. And so military strategy in that day was get as many horses as you can. And God told Solomon, don't multiply horses to yourself. Why? Because I want you to trust in me. Some trust in horses, some in chariots. But what did the Bible say? But we will trust in the Lord our God. He said, you don't need all this stuff everybody else has got. You got me. But here's the problem. If you get everything everybody else has got, you won't think you need me. So he said, Solomon, don't multiply horses to yourself. You can have a few, but don't get a big arrangement. So what did Solomon do? He built hundreds and hundreds of, of those stalls to put all these horses from Egypt that he brought in. He broke that. And the next thing was, don't marry strange wives. They'll turn your heart. What did Solomon do? He married bunches and bunches of them. In other words, he had the wisdom of men. He was very wise. But the wisdom of men won't cut it. Be not wise in your own eyes. I think his wisdom went to his head and he got to thinking, I'm smart enough to figure this out by myself. And that's where he messed up. When you start not needing God, 
you're in trouble. And as an old man, he lost his humility and his heart was not right with the Lord. Proverbs 3 contains some of the most off-quoted verses on pursuing God. The source of all wisdom. Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy paths. So whatever situation you've got coming forth towards you, ask God, help me to make the right decision. Yeah, but it looks obvious, Pastor. Listen, Pastor, if I do this, I'm going to make more money. Yeah, but money's not the principal thing. If you make more money and you bust hell wide open, you've been a fool. Some things look like you know what to do, but even if you think you know what to do, my suggestion to you is hit your knees and say, Lord... Help me. Give me wisdom to do the right thing. And if you're in a situation and it ain't feeling right, hit your knees and say, Lord, what do I do? Stay or go? Tell me what to do. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And the Bible says he will. Everybody say will. Will. So when will God not help you? When you don't ask for it. Hello? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. The biggest of problems, the smallest of problems, ask God. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. In other words, when you acknowledge Him, you are recognizing He is with me right now. So I can talk to Him right now. He will hear me and He will answer me. And he will direct my path. And that is wisdom. Don't live as if God's not there. Live as if he is there. Some people live as if the pastor's not here. I can do whatever I want. Yeah, but God is there. These verses challenge us to override our own human inclination to trust ourselves with much of anything. We must have the humility to avoid learning are leaning upon our own understanding. As smart as you get, you still don't know everything. Proverbs 3 and 7 warns us not to be wise in our own eyes. Even if we think we are right, we should humble ourselves and ask the Lord, now Lord, am I right? Or is this just not best? Or maybe it's just not the right timing. You know, sometimes you're right, but it ain't the right time. Before you go to that person, you might want to ask the Lord, Lord, is is now a good time or should I wait? We must have the humility to pray for a God's eye view of our situation because we might think we know what to do, but we might be 100% wrong. We can take a, a molehill and make a mountain if we use our own wisdom. Yeah, but they need this instruction. They might need it, but they may not need it from you. Why don't you pray and say, Lord, should I bring this to them? Or do you have someone else you'd like to deliver the mail? Following the wisdom of the Lord leads us to great rewards. Proverbs 3 and 10 speaks of the new wine literally bursting forth from our presses as God blesses our life when we follow his wisdom. If we are willing to receive these blessings, we must also be willing to receive the correction of the Lord. For the the same psalm that talks about these blessings goes in to tells us that don't be upset when the Lord gets on to you. That's just proof that he loves you. I can tell you this, if my neighbor's kids play in the streets, I'm not going to drag them off and whip them. But my kids, I love them too much to let them do something like that. That's how we look at God every once in a while. When we feel like he turned us over his proverbial knee and wore us out, we ought to, we're going to cry a little bit, but we ought to somewhere say, Oh, God, thank you for loving me so much. It's one thing to humble ourselves to be wise, but it's quite another thing to accept the chastening of the Lord and to admit when we have done wrong. Here's one thing people pray, Lord, do whatever you have to do to get me to heaven. I've prayed that. 
then don't get upset when he does. Right. <laughs> well, God, there's a little caveat there, God, and it was in fine print. Don't do this. No, you said do whatever you got to do. When we face these situations, we should be thankful for the discipline of the Lord because it reveals his love for us. For if the Lord cannot discipline us, Bible says we're not really his children anyway. We're illegitimate. We don't really belong to him. And if we continue behaving like that, guess what he'll do? He'll back off. He'll quit correcting us. And boy, are we ever in trouble then. I'm still thankful every time the Holy Ghost does a little click in my spirit says, uh-uh. All right. No, no, no. You know you shouldn't say that or watch that or do you know? Yes, Lord, you're right. I'm sorry. Thank God he still corrects me. Wise people humble themselves. Wise Christians desire God's correction and God's direction. The me first individualistic world that we live in makes it difficult to embrace humility and accept the discipline required to be disciples of Jesus Christ. For the word disciple comes from the root word discipline. And that means if I'm going to be his disciple, he's going to get to correct me. People are discussing which pronoun they preferred based on whatever rights they assume they have. But here's the truth of the matter. Ain't none of us got any real rights. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He owns it all. He owns you. He owns me. He owns the cattle on a thousand hill and all the taters underneath it. It's all God's. So where does this confusion come from, pride? What people should be declaring is, my pronouns are me, myself, and I. Why? Because I'm selfish. I demand my way. That's earthly wisdom. That's not the wisdom that's from above. The wisdom that's from above is honest and truthful and peaceful, easily entreated. Does not stir up strife or anger or cause problems. The wisdom that's from above is, is the highway of peace. Well, there's nothing wrong with taking care of ourselves and self-care. We must humble ourselves to advance in the right way. 1 Peter 5 and 6 says this, Humble yourselves. Everybody say, humble yourself. That may be the hardest thing you'll ever do. But I can tell you this, if you don't humble yourself and you're asking God to get you to heaven, get ready to be humbled. Lord, do whatever you got to do to get me to heaven. But I'm not changing a thing. Woo! Well, get ready for stuff to break. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. That means you stay down as long as it takes. We must all embrace humility and stay faithful to the will and the wisdom of God. Backsliding will not happen if we humble ourselves to God's discipline. See, backsliding happens when we get upset because God corrected us. How dare God tell me that? Well, you're on your way out. You may not be gone yet. Your spirit's gone. Your body might still be here, but your spirit's gone. And pretty soon your body will follow it. If we handle backsliding or the correction of God the wrong way, we will soon be gone. But we should have the wisdom of God that says, thank you, Lord, for correcting me. It doesn't make sense to be thankful for correction. I don't remember my dad ever spanking me. I thought, well, that was great, Dad. Sure do appreciate that good whooping. When can I get another one of those? Can we schedule that on the calendar? Maybe once a week. What do you say? No, I never did that. Didn't like it at all. I remember running away from him. Yes. My dad had a leather belt and he knew what it was used for. One was to hold your britches up and the other one you can guess. But he knew what it was for. He spared me though. He drove a rebellious heart out of me. 
because we've all got a rebellious heart. We're all born with a rebellious spirit. We're all born with a me, my mentality. And God in his love will drive that out of us so that we'll trust him and humble ourselves to him. Following God's wise plans for our lives will ultimately lead to reward. You see, the best life, the best life, I'm going to say it again, the best life that you can possibly have is in the will of God. You may not be as rich as everybody else. You may not be as strong as everybody else. You may, be, may not be as popular as everybody else, but the best life you can have is smack dab in the will of God. The best home you can ever have is in the will of God. And finally, the best eternity you can ever have is in the will of God. And the only way you can have that is through submission to the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Those who follow the path of the wise will have a greater chance of leading happier and healthier lives. I've noticed that birds of a feather flock together. The Bible speaks of a wise man hangs around with wise men. Be careful what you hang around because you're going to be like that if you're not real careful. That's why we need church so we can get around people that love this truth and love the things of God and want to go to heaven. So what they are can rub off a little bit on us. Amen? Amen. We must be wary of focusing too much on the gifts that come from wisdom because wisdom has gifts. And we know Solomon's wives turned his heart away from God, but perhaps he forgot some of his own proverbs that he wrote that we read this morning. As he leaned to his own understanding. He forsook the law of God and went after his own decisions. And it cost him dearly. He got, the, got pretty rich and he started thinking, I think I'm all right. What would happen tomorrow if you won the billions of dollars? You might not show back up for church. You'd be on an island. Yeah. Be, there you go. That money is going to perish. Co-workers talking about all this money they're going to get. I thought, yeah, you may not show back up for work, but that money is going to be gone one day. But your soul is going to live forever. And when Solomon got all this wealth and all these provisions his heart leaned to his own understanding, and it cost him. It cost his family. It cost the kingdom. It cost everybody. All of wisdom's paths are peace. And a truly wise person will always seek for peace. Solomon's taxation policies eventually led to the division of his kingdom. If the king had held to his own wisdom and the peace it provided, the kingdom could have maintained its unity. What happened with Solomon, though, although he was so wise, he began to implement things that cause disunity. And those who are not wise will cause disunity. They'll tear things up. You know why? The reason they're not really wise is because they're not really humble. The reason we can't have the unity God wants in the church is because we're having trouble humbling ourselves. If everybody was really, really humble all the time, which I'm not, but if we were always humble and loved one another and served one another and looked after each other, we'd have perfect unity. But every once in a while, our old fleshly pride pops up and says, that ain't the way I'd do it. I don't know why they did that. And we begin to have problems. But true wisdom seeks for unity. We have a wise Lord who is more concerned about meeting our needs than giving us gifts that might lead us astray. And in his wisdom, he doesn't give us some things. 
We often thank the Lord for all the blessings He gives us, but perhaps we should also thank Him for the many blessings He has not given us. Because God is wise enough to know that we probably can't handle it. It might lead us astray. It might take us to a devil's hell. It might be something that's not really good for us after all. I don't think God's against us having money, but he is certainly against money having us. God's not against a lot of things that we do, but he doesn't want that to consume us or take a hold of us so that we become wise in our own eyes. In a world where many people offer advice from all places of counsel, we must be careful to follow the right kind of wisdom because there is worldly wisdom. And worldly wisdom might have some benefits, but worldly wisdom alone will not lead to the ultimate success. See, godly wisdom says, give him the first fruits. That's godly wisdom. Give him your first and give him your best. Worldly wisdom says, no, that's foolishness. Don't do that. Take care of all your stuff first and then give God what's left. That's worldly wisdom. But God says, put me first and watch what I can do. That's godly wisdom, but it doesn't make any sense to the world. Tithes and offering don't make any sense to the world. What do you mean you're going to give stuff? Why would you do that? Because what I'm going to give can't really buy what I want anyway. Well, what do you want? I want peace in my home. I want peace in my heart. I want God to direct my path. When I'm about to make a foolish mistake, I want God to step in and say, uh-uh, don't do that. So I need to put God first now. Matthew 16, verse 26. Matthew 16, verse 26. What is it profited? What is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Well, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? <clears throat> That's wisdom right there. Be careful what's got a hold of you. True wisdom can only be found in Jesus Christ. He is the wisdom of God. He is the testimony of God. The Bible says blood, water, and spirit in 1 John is the testimony of God. Today we had testimony service. People got up and they said things that God done from or whatever it was in testimony service, but that was our testimony. But you know, God testifies too. He testified in Christ Jesus, blood, water, and spirit. Those are the three witnesses of God. Well, where did it happen? Only twice in your Bible does, the, does God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Twice. One was at the baptism. When Jesus went down in baptism with John baptizing him, the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that was that water. God testified when water was applied that he was happy. The next time we see God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, it's at the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus appeared to them in a spirit form. That spirit. And the voice from heaven came down and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Now we've got a witness of water and we've got a witness of spirit. Where's the witness of blood at? Glad you asked. It's at Calvary. Because at Calvary, God spoke without saying a word. As Jesus was on the cross, blood was being shed. As blood was flowing, the Bible says the temple was rent from top to bottom. Not bottom to top. That was significant. That was God showing I'm the one doing this. A man couldn't reach up and grab the top and rend it. He'd have had to rend from the bottom. But the, the, the veil was rent from top to bottom. 
And in this story, we still have someone saying the Son of God, but this time it's the soldier. Somebody else looked in at what was going on. Graves bursting open, a lightning storm, tombs bursting open, veil rent from top to bottom, and the soldier said, surely this must have been the Son of God. And so in our Bible, we have a witness of blood, water, and spirit in Jesus Christ. And that is the wisdom of God. Say, that's so simple. Yeah, but that's wiser than anything you can think of. Because the wisdom of God is wiser than anything we can ever think of. And worldly wisdom is self-promotion. Well, then what is godly wisdom? Self-demotion. John said it like this, he must increase and I must decrease. The only way God can rule is if I get off the throne. As long as I'm ruling, he can't or he won't. But when I demote myself, he can become what I need. And here's the great thing, when I demote myself, he can become my promoter. I'm going to close with this. Boxing. Every good fighter has a promoter. Could it be that when God looks down at certain people in his church, people that stay humble and don't get arrogant and try to bring peace and try to love, could it be that God's looking around and saying, have you considered my, my servant, Brother Lee? I'm promoting him. Could it be that God wants to promote us to more, better, other stuff? And if we'll just, see the Bible says, humble yourselves to God and in due season. Sometimes the humbling is not overnight. Sometimes you got to keep down long enough to where finally God says, I'm going to pick you up. I don't know about you, but I want God to be my promoter. Amen. Let's stand.